This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Crashed to death, five people lose their lives and dozens are injured at a concert in the Algerian capital, Algiers. Urgent calls from world leaders to save Brazil's Amazon rainforest as it continues to burn. Those countries that send money here, they're not doing it for charity. I hope everyone can understand that. They're doing it because they have a vested interest. The impact of conflict on education. 1.91 million children left without education in West and Central Africa in just two years. Also in the program, a second chance of life. Scientists attempt to save white rhinos from near extinction, even though the last male has died. And in sports, with under a month to go to the Rugby World Cup in Japan, how inclusive is the South African team? We hear from a Springbok legend. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Five young people have been killed and dozens injured, some critically, in a crash at a concert on Thursday night in the Algerian capital, Algiers. Reports say that thousands had gathered at the entrance of a stadium uh, to see the local rap star, Abderahouf Deraji, better known as Soul King. The rapper who lives in France shot to stardom in his homeland last year with the song La, Liber La Liberté, which he dedicated to protesters engaged in months of anti-government demonstrations. Well, joining me from Algiers is the journalist Mohamed Alal from the newspaper El Kaba, who was at the concert last night. Uh, Mohamed, what happened? Yeah, it was so difficult to explain the situation. Now, it is uh, when we, when the concert started, the police blocked the the entrance, and was a lot of people, more than thirty thousand. And this area is very popular, and we don't use uh, to have a concert with this huge uh, people. So they start open the door at uh, six, and then after two hours, they decide to close the door to organize the people inside. In that time. People thought, uh, people outside thought there is no enough place, so they start push each other, and this is this is one hour or maybe less, uh, half an hour before the uh, concert uh, start. It was here that the name of Saw King he will be on stage. So they thought there is no there is no space inside. They think uh, they ha have a ticket and there is no chance to to attend this uh, concert. So this is make some uh, movement and people start push each other and this accident happened. Yeah, so we understand that five people lost their lives, but have authorities, the stadium authorities, the organizers, the police, anyone, has there been any reaction to this? So the organizer, he just resigned or, uh, right now, in a few, few minutes ago, and they open uh, a big, uh, I mean, there is there is investigation now by the government, a big investigation, so we have to wait more more details. But the, right now, there is uh, the, the, the director of the organization, Londa, who organized this event, he resigned right now, and maybe there will be also, some people said, maybe Maybe the, uh, the Ministry of Culture, she will resign also. We don't know exactly, but it is really a problem here in Algeria now. You were there when all this was happening. It must have been a terrible experience for you. Exactly, yes. I was there right in the same time when people start pushing each other. So I was really watching these people, uh, I mean, in crowd and uh, very, very, there is young people. I mean, uh, one of uh, people die, he have only 13 years old. So a lot of family and and the it's, area is very small outside. And also the entrance is very small. So it's not enough. To, to receive. There was around nearly 5,000 outside waiting their chance to inside. The problem, there is enough place inside, So, but no one told them there is enough place. So just, it's all about the organization. I, I was very worried about the situation, about myself. Also, me, it was very difficult as a journalist to go inside the the, the stadium. So, uh, so it's it is it is a, a very very regretful uh, right. situation yesterday. Yeah. All right, Mohammed Alal.
Thank you for taking time you. to bring us up to speed with that very devastating story. Thank you. Well, let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa. A journalist has been arrested in Tanzania, accused of publishing fake news about alleged police abuse of suspects in custody. Joseph Ngandie works for Watetezi television station. It's one that is established, was established last year by the Tanzania Human Rights Defenders Coalition. Now, U.S. authorities have charged 80 people, most of who are thought to be Nigerian nationals, with participating in a conspiracy to steal millions of dollars. Prosecutors say the suspects used business, email, fraud and romance scams to con victims, many of them elderly. Authorities say it is one of the largest cases of its kind in U.S. history. Malawi's President Peter Mutarika has vowed to crack down on protesters planning to shut airports and borders for three days from Monday next week. He's ordered the army to protect the borders with all the necessary force from demonstrators angry over the alleged rigging of the May elections. Now, the Amazon rainforest is the lungs of the world, or so it's often described. Now, several European leaders have warned Brazil that it needs to take urgent action to help prevent devastating forest fires that are sweeping across the Amazon. The crisis is likely to, to top the agenda at this weekend's G7 summit. The Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, has also accused NGOs of starting the fire. Let's get more on this so we can speak to Christian Lambrex, who is a former policy officer at the UN's Environment Programme. He joins us uh, from central Kenya uh, in near Mount Kenya. We, we, we were talking about the fires we saw all day, quite alarming. Uh, what does this mean for the future of the forest, forest itself and indeed the impact on us? Yes, I mean, no doubt, and uh, first of all, good evening, but no doubt the forest fires in Brazil are quite alarming. And they're quite alarming because we are first dealing with the largest rainforest in the world. But also they are quite alarming because those forest fires means a major loss in terms of biodiversity, in terms of fauna and flora, in terms of forest habitat. And uh, that fauna and flora and forest habitat, of, of course, belongs to the people of Boise, but also are part of uh, uh, human heritage. And as such, it is a concern for every single person on this planet to see the rainforest in Brazil being on fires. But I, of course, the concern was the... Con yes? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, bring it back, let's bring it back to the continent now. How big an issue is deforestation and are gov governments really concerned about it? Are you talking about the continent here in, in Africa? In Africa, yes. Yes, I mean, in Africa, some, some countries have been making some major progress towards uh, conserving a, a forest. And I can speak about countries like... Uh, Tanzania and Kenya, where currently we are operating very actively. And uh, a government over the past 20 years have been put in place some uh, policies and some laws aiming at conserving the forest and also aiming at setting up target in terms of forest cover in the country. I can give you some, some stunning examples uh, here in Kenya, where the new constitution that has been enacted in 2010 set a very specific target of a 10% of forest cover in the country. And recently, the head of states has announced that he wants the target to be achieved by the year 2022. So here we have already pronouncements that are being made by the top executive aiming at not only rehabilitating the forest, but also increasing the forest cover in the, in the country. Right. Clearly, so, so, those so, statements so, so. really help every single stakeholder who are aiming at supporting and boosting forest conservation in the country. All right, so th these are policies that are being enforced by government, but what about the people themselves and the benefits of really conserving forests? Does that go down well? It goes down well. I mean, uh, beyond the policies, of course, some specific laws have to be enacted to put those policies in place. And we have seen the case here in Kenya where the new Forest Act of 2016 provides for co-management of the forest by the government together with the forest adjacent communities. And you know, every issue that you can see in the forest are usually issues being triggered by human beings. And at the same time, human beings can be the solution to those problems. It's a matter of engagement. If you engage the people positively, you are able to turn them from being the source of the problems to actually the solutions. And 
So this is what those laws here in Kenya have been aiming at achieving by calling for co-management and ensuring that forest adjacent communities and all key, store, uh, and all key stakeholders are directly involved in the co-management of the forest. Right. And we can see actually some major, some major change uh, taking place on Mount Kenya and the Aberdeers, All right. uh, as well in part of the Mao, All where right. communities are now fully engaged and they are fully empowered, and they really see the forest like their forest, okay. like, like okay. an asset from where they benefit. All right, Christian Lambrex, uh, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much for giving us an overview of what exactly governments and people are really doing about the issue of deforestation. Thank you. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, why are Kenyan footballer, football fans like this talking about this weekend's censors on social media? Find out in sports. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top story on this program, in Algeria, five people were crushed to death and dozens injured at a concert on Thursday night in the capital, Algiers. Almost two million children have been forced out of school in West and Central Africa as violence against schools reaches an all-time high. According to UNICEF's latest report, schools, students and teachers are being deliberately targeted. From June this year, UNICEF records that just shy of 10,000 schools were closed across West and Central Africa. And that means education for children is seriously a threat in Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Mali and many other countries in the region. The number of school closures has in fact tripled since 2017 when the number was just under 3,000. UNICEF says the impact from rising insecurity and violence impacts both children's education and overall safety. Well, let's bring in Patsy Nakel. She's with UNICEF's Africa Unit. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. 1.9 million children. That's a huge number and quite alarming. How did you arrive at this number? How did you conduct the survey? Well, we work with local, uh, with local partners. We ourselves are out in the field in all of these countries and in these conflict-affected areas. So this is a painstaking, the result of painstaking work. We go out to, to schools, we, we make surveys about whether they are still functioning or not. And this number, indeed, as you said, is absolutely horrifying, especially in light of the fact that many of these countries, many of these regions are actually struggling when it comes to development. And this has an effect not only on the children themselves, the 1.9 million children, and there is a face and a family behind every single one of them, but it affects their families, it affects their communities, it affects their entire countries, if you will, and yeah, will most likely be affecting them for the rest of their lifespan. It, but is there a particular reason why schools, teachers, students are particularly being targeted? Well, there most likely are several reasons. Uh, there are there's strategic reasons why uh, certain parties to conflict would want to scare uh, the local communities. We also see that in many of these con conflicts across the eight countries, uh, education itself, what is perceived as Western-style education, is actually at the core of many of this crisis. So, so that is the reason. And in any, in any situation, uh, this is absolutely wrong. And, and our unequivocal call is for these attacks and the threats of attacks to stop immediately because children belong in school. Every child needs to be in a school bench learning maths, learning reading skills. Mm. And that but, has to happen immediately. But it is not all doom and gloom because you have been working with local communities to make sure that uh, children still are able to gain some education. What are some of the things you've been able to do, for instance? Yes, absolutely, you're right. It's definitely not all doom and gloom. In the, in the face of incredible uh, difficulty, there is a lot of resistance. Every single family that I met, every single child that I spoke to said one thing, they want to go back to school. School is important. Education is important. Learning is important. Uh, just this morning, I spoke with a colleague, a teacher in Maiduguri in, in northeast Nigeria, who is saying that enrollment, wherever a school is reopening, enrollment is coming back up to the numbers seen even previously before the conflict. Families are desperate to have their children back in school. It's probably the only lifeline that they have to any sort of development. And we must stand shoulder to shoulder with them to make sure that schools are safe, are safe havens so that children, also in those parts of the world, have access to school. All right. Uh, Patsy Nakel, thank you for taking time to talk to us and focus on Africa. Thank you.
Now, staying with the education, some of Africa's most vulnerable children are those with special needs. We've been speaking to the parents of a Kenyan girl, Shiro Theory, who struggled to place their three-year-old child with Down syndrome in a mainstream school. When I see her, I see, I see hope, I see faith, I see the glory of God, I see, I see everything that I believe in. When she just came out, there's something I realized, but I wasn't sure what it was. So I just asked the doctor, is the baby okay? And the doctor assured me that the baby was fine. She kind of started reacting after um, like 10 minutes, she started crying. But all this time I was a bit scared. I was asking, I was just asking a question, how is the baby? Is she okay? Is that how normal babies look like? And the doctor assured me that she was fine. <laughs> Emotionally, it has been so challenging because of uh, having to deal with my own emotions and having to deal with my wife's own emotions. Every school we go to, they'll say we don't take such kids. So we looked for several schools and then we just came back home and we decided if we're going to look for a school for Shiro, we have to go with her. So we'll go with her and we tell her Shiro has this condition and she'll be coming with her therapist and say no, we don't take such kids. like to urge uh, the men not to shy away from their responsibilities in cases where maybe uh, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have gotten children with, uh, with challenges like Down syndrome or any other challenge. So let's not run away, let's not shy away, let's move on. For me I care less about, about what they say, totally, because she's all I have. She's very happy, she's very jovial and she keeps me so much uh, so much uh, occupied that I don't even have to care about if others are looking at us or not. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport, Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. South African clubs Mamalodi Sundowns and Orlando Pirates are among five former CAF Champions League trophy winners, trailing by one goal on aggregate ahead of preliminary round second legs. This weekend, they're joined by Asante Kotoko of Ghana, Eimba of Nigeria, and Etoile Sohel of Tunisia, all of whom enjoy home advantage. Eimba, the 2003 and 2004 champions from southeastern Nigeria, must play behind closed doors as they seek to overcome a 1 0 deficit against debutant Rahimo of Burkina Faso. Now, he is Africa's most expensive football export, but Ivory Coast International Nicolas Pepe is yet to make a start for his new side, Arsenal, in the English Premier League. But that could change this weekend. Arsenal manager Unai Emery has suggested that Pepe, who is also the club's record signing, might be ready to start his first Premier League uh, game against Liverpool this Saturday. The 23-year-old moved from Lille earlier this month for a club record fee of £88 million, and Emery says he's settling quite nicely in North London. Now, this year's Rugby World Cup kicks off in Japan in just under one month, and Africa will be represented by South Africa and Namibia. In South Africa, the sports was traditionally seen as a white sport, but that is beginning to change. Brian Habana was one of five black players in the squad when they won the Webb Ellis Cup in 2007. He says, though a lot has been done, there's still room for improvement. I think first and foremost, you know, one needs to understand that South Africa is probably a country with the most unique history that no other rugby playing or sporting, you know, participating nation potentially has to deal with, you know. And, you know, one looks at the apartheid era where rugby was, you know, seen as a very predominantly white sport. And, and I think we've come a long way since that. You know, 2007, you had the likes of myself, JP Peterson, you know, Wayne Julius, Ashwin Willemser, Enrico January, um, players of colour really coming to the fore and, and trying to make a difference. What would you say has been the effort made to close the gap in terms of diversity? To look back in 2018 and see Sia Khaleesi become the first black South African to captain the Springboks, you know, run out in front of that team at Ellis Park, which is probably one of the most iconic rugby stadiums in the world, and assimilate to something that happened back in 1995, where, you know, the late, great Nelson Mandela, you know, walked out onto Ellis Park with that number six Springbok jersey on his back and handed that cup called Bill to Francois Pina. And yes, our country's still got a long way to go. I think there's been a lot tried to improve transformation, to try and include everyone from all races, all you know, shapes and form, um, male, female, you know, black, white. I think our country's you know, potentially got a long way to go, but you know, that moment, seeing Sia run out there and, and do something special was 
not only an incredibly proud moment for all of us as South Africans, but I think an incredibly symbolic moment, you know, of how much our rugby can actually progress. And again, if that's the starting point, you know, one really looks forward to seeing what the end is going to be. In terms of the public perception of um, rugby and, of course, the Springbok, you look at the women's side. I mean, they've qualified for the 2021 World Cup in New Zealand. And when you go around, you see the fans singing black, white, the vast African culture. You hear all of them singing for the Springbok women's side. Does that really reflect how much you guys have done in terms of you know, improving and spreading the sport around? Incredibly proud moment for us South Africans, knowing that our women have achieved such greatness. An incredibly proud moment for the game of rugby for women. Um, I think seeing the phenomenal growth uh, from a women's rugby perspective over the last three, four years has been absolutely incredible. Now, spare a thought for fans of English Premier League teams in Kenya this weekend as they seem to have been shown a red card for this weekend's games. With a census taking place on Saturday and Sunday, the government has decided to restrict movement on these days. And that in turn means that most fans will miss out on the league action. Owing to the high cost of satellite TV in the country, most fans meet in viewing centres like this to watch games but won't be able to this weekend as they have all been ordered shut. The hashtag Census2019 is now trending on social media and fans have been tweeting their solutions to this conundrum. Um, Honourable Williams has tweeted, if we can't go to the bar, then we'll bring the bar to us with a picture of a man carrying about 10 bottles of beer. While Trison Bella has tweeted a picture of a water dispenser filled with what looks like beer. And Sophie, some of them are suggesting that the ones who live on the border with Uganda, that <laughs> they might cross into Uganda on Saturday to watch Liverpool versus Arsenal. Yeah, I saw that. I thought it was quite funny. The things you do for football. Right? <laughs> the things you do for football. Thank you for yes. the sport, Peter. Thank you. Now, how do you save an animal species from extinction? Some scientists have attempted that by successfully extracting eggs from the world's last two surviving northern white female rhinos. The team of scientists and conservationists carried out the process in Kenya, where the rhinos are kept in a sanctuary. The BBC's Emmanuel Igunza tells us more. A delicate and groundbreaking fertility treatment to try and save these rare northern white rhinos from extinction. There are only two of this kind in the world, and on Thursday, a group of scientists move even closer to saving this subspecies. They harvested five eggs each from two northern white females named Najin and Fatu. Later, they will be artificially inseminated with frozen sperm from one of the last male of the subspecies who is now dead. But due to genetic problems with both Najin and Fatu, the fertilized egg will be carried to term by a surrogate southern white rhino. This technique has not been used on northern white rhinos, but scientists have been encouraged by the birth of this southern white calf in the U.S. using the same method. Sudan, seen here, was the last surviving northern white rhino. He died last year due to old age. The northern white rhino was once common throughout East and Central Africa, including Uganda, South Sudan, the DRC and Chad. Illegal hunting of rhino horns, however, caused a rapid decline in the wild, and the rhino subspecies was declared extinct in the wild in 2008. But there is growing optimism among conservationists that this could be the beginning of a revival of this near-extinct species. Emmanuel Gunza, BBC News. Let's take a quick look at the top story today on Focus on Africa. Five young people have been killed and dozens injured, some critically, in a crash at a concert on Thursday night in Algeria. Reports say that thousands of people had gathered at the entrance of a stadium in the capital, Algiers, to see the local rap star, Abdel Rauf Deraji, better known as Sul King. Let's focus on Africa for now. Thanks for your company.